Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Lawrence Bert Green. Lawrence is an award-winning biography, biographer, historian, and chronicle of exploration. By my latest count on his Amazon page, he has 12 books about historic, historical figures such as Christopher Columbus, Marco Polo, Ferdinand Magellan, and many more. And today, we will speak about his latest book, In Search of a Kingdom, Francis Drake, Elizabeth I, and the Perilous Birth of the English Empire, or British Empire. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Elaine. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to read uh, a little bit about the English history and how the empire came about. Uh, um, but before we get there, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. How is it that, first of all, you became interested in writing, then historical writing, and then most of your book has been about this time period of the discovery of many nations and continents. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm from New York City, where, where I am right now, but I've lived in all different places around the United States, and I lived in London for a while, and some other places I travel a lot. Um, I got interested in writing, really, it was just sort of second nature, as soon as I learned to, to read, and, uh, but I never really thought it had any professional implications. Uh, my parents were both lawyers, I'm sure they wanted me to be a lawyer, and, um, but as time went on, I kept writing more and more, uh, and then after college, I went to Harvard, and then after college, I wasn't sure what to do. Um, I started journalism because, um, you know, it was there. And, uh, but I still couldn't figure out what to do. I was interested in broadcasting for a while. Then one thing led to another. And finally, um, uh, various articles I was writing led to a book. And then one book led to another book. And uh, so here we are 12, 12 books later. And, uh, you know, I never really know what's coming. I don't know what book I'm going to be doing after Drake. It's a kind of mysterious process. However, at one point, I wrote a book published about 20 years ago called Voyage to Mars. And it was about NASA's exploration of the red planet. And uh, it was fascinating to spend time with the NASA scientists who were very dedicated, very interesting but also to hear them talk about the concept of exploration. Now, of course, they were exploring Mars, but everything was by analogy of what, you know, had happened here on Earth, especially in the 16th century, in the so-called age of exploration or age of discovery. Okay, so that was Columbus and Magellan and Da Gama and many, many others. Um, and uh, I started to think about it. I often, loved to go sailing with my son, my son Nick, um, who's a, a racer. So we had spent a lot of time on the water and I'd often thought about writing something about sailing and exploring, but I didn't know what, it was very vague in my mind. However, after having been exposed to these NASA scientists, they named one of their missions Magellan, or in England, as they say, Magellan. And I wondered about Magellan. I thought maybe he would be an interesting subject for a book. And of course, he was the first person to try to circumnavigate the world. He, he didn't succeed. He was killed along the way um, in the Philippines, but some of the, a few survivors did make it. And um, I thought that would just be a terrific story. It, was, it seemed very exciting to me. You know, it was unbelievable. And of course, it was so, it was too ambitious because it encompassed the entire world as it was 500 years ago. And I thought, well, that's a very, very tall order. Nevertheless, uh, partly because it was a little bit impossible, I thought it'd be a good subject for a book. So that was the first book, although that was my seventh book. It was the first one I wrote about exploring, you know, as a, with a capital E. And uh, that book was successful. And then that led to several others, uh, Marco Polo, um, uh, uh, Drake, um, and a few others. I wrote one with my daughter about Cheng Ho, the Chinese explorer, who's not well known in the West, but every school child in China knows about this fantastic explorer and their incredible ships and technology. So I just became interested in exploring as a 
um, as a way to uh, examine history because you sort of see everything through the explorer's eyes. And of course, well, no matter where you're coming from, everybody, we all have our built-in biases. So um, you can see how things change depending on where they're coming from, literally, you know, or where they are. So uh, I found the, the clash or the combination of cultures very interesting. And uh, because it, they all were changed, Magellan and Drake, they all were changed by their explorations in some way. Once they had gone out to see the world, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't the same anymore. And of course, the information they brought back, you know, transformed their countries. And it's true with Drake in England and uh, true with Magellan. Uh, they all owed their uh, sense of wanderlust to Marco Polo. And uh, of course, that was much earlier, a couple hundred years earlier. And he didn't sail, really. He did a little bit of sailing. That was over land. But he was, all Europe knew about other parts of the world came from his books. And it was considered to be a mixture of fact and fiction. We now know it's 99% true. You know, it was almost all fact. Uh, so, uh, you know, he was a very influential figure. After the Magellan book, I remember thinking, well, if that book succeeded, if I didn't embarrass myself, I would like to take Drake because he was the second circumnavigator right. and he learned from Magellan's mistakes. So, and he survived, you know, he successfully circumnavigated the world. Um, he was in an alliance with Queen Elizabeth I. He was, he was a pirate really, but uh, you know, he was uh, in an alliance with her and you know, his adventures were fascinating. So anyway, that's what happened. And I was, because he survived, you know, he, and he, he needed Magellan's information to do that. If he, you know, he understood. Magellan was so ill-equipped to do this, for example, when he finished crossing what we now call the Strait of Magellan in uh, near the Southern uh, uh, tip of South America, he thought that the Pacific Ocean was maybe two or 300 yards miles uh, across and of course it's thousands and thousands of miles it's the largest body of water on the planet by far and he had no idea it, it would take well he died in the middle but it would take uh, almost a year for the ships to make that final leg um, so you know he really was ill-equipped to do this but Magellan learned from I'm sorry Drake learned from uh, Magellan's mistakes uh, he, he came Drake was a complicated, interesting figure, in more ways, more interesting than Magellan, who, who was kind of remote and very stern. And, you know, we don't really know that much about him personally. You know, we have a few personal details about him, but we don't have a, a lot of letters, almost nothing in his handwriting um, about him in, in his own, in his own uh, words. But um, Drake, we know, we can see much better as a person. He was from Devon in Southern England, you know, red hair, a fiery temperament, the oldest of 12 children. Um, he, uh, England at that time was, you know, recovering from the reign of Henry VIII, and it was often on the verge of civil war because of the uh, stress of Henry VIII. There was, uh, uh, the Church of England had just been formed, so this was just after, um, I guess, the beginning of the Reformation. And uh, Drake was a Protestant, which made a big difference. Of course, Queen Elizabeth was a Protestant. And, you know, if Drake had not been a Protestant, she would not have selected him to be one of her pirates or captains or whatever you want to call it. And, of course, Elizabeth became queen at the age of 25 by almost by accident. She was not in the line of succession. It's just that the Mary Queen of Scots, who was Catholic, uh, died young from cancer. And suddenly the way was clear for this uh, well-educated, highly intelligent, uh, but, you know, rather cloistered and shy woman to become the, the first queen of England in years. And she was the only queen who never married, you know, English queen. And because she felt if she, and it's true, if she did marry, she would lose her, her husband would then become the one with all the power or most of the power. And the longer she became, uh, remained queen, the more Machiavellian and skillful and cunning she became. 
and she was not necessarily a nice person. Um, you know, she could send people to their deaths, you know, almost on a whim. Um, and she knew how to use her power. She was nothing like her father, Henry VIII, you know, who was a lunatic. But, uh, you know, she could be lethal uh, when she needed to. But she was a very strategic thinker. You know, just, just keep in mind her background. Her father's Henry VIII, um, who was married six times, you know, and kept executing his wives. Her mother um, was Anne Boleyn, um, who was also famous and notorious. I mean, it's just sort of an unbelievably difficult background. It's remarkable that she was as uh, sane and centered as she was, and, and also, you know, quite, quite brilliant. Also red hair, like uh, uh, Drake. And, and Drake came to her attention. Um, he had started out in Devon um, in the local merchant marine there. And uh, he then went to, for a while, England was involved in the slave trade. They backed out of it eventually, but at that time, uh, they were kind of middlemen. They were uh, stealing slaves from the Portuguese who had captured them. And then they were uh, uh, reselling them. Um, when Drake saw slavery in operation, I don't want to overemphasize this, he, he just recoiled. You know, he found it was terrible. He also acquired a, an abiding hatred of Spain. Uh, I mean, he really hated Spain. So the English-Spanish rivalry in Drake's mind was very, very strong. Uh, he had a cousin who was uh, uh, captured by the Spanish Inquisition and spent his life in exile. Um, he had another cousin who was uh, also um, in the slave trade um, with Drake, uh, who was older, who showed him the ropes, but it, it, it just, didn't, he, he really didn't like it. Uh, what Drake wanted to do was make money. He wanted gold and that was really his driving I'd like to say he was idealistic. He was interested in freedom, uh, but it really was gold. He, he really wanted gold. And uh, he thought there were easier ways to do this than trading in slaves. So the best way to get gold, he decided, was to steal treasure from the Spanish. Now, you know, as you know, Spain at that time had a huge empire. They were the biggest empire in the Western world by far. Um, and uh, Philip was the king of Spain. He had several wives. They were very wealthy, although they spent a lot of their money on kind of pointless foreign wars. And uh, England was really uh, almost an afterthought. They were, you know, a small, isolated island nation. At one time, they'd had a colony on the coast of France, but they lost it. Uh, so you, you had uh, England, which was the big, you know, the big um, power and it, it looked like at any time, King Philip would say, ah, I think it's time to overrun uh, England and conquer it and make it part of the Spanish empire. He was on the verge of doing that several times, but Elizabeth was very deft in sort of holding him at arm's length and making it seem it would not be worth his while. And she also tried not to antagonize him so that he didn't feel provoked uh, that he had to do it and then he had the other targets that were better, better suited. Drake uh, operated on his own for a while, simply going around, sailing to the New World along the coast of Brazil uh, and stealing gold from Spanish encampments. Um, they, the Spain got the gold, they got, uh, they had, they mined it or they had Indians in uh, Central and South, South America mine it. And then they would pile it up and carry it back to um, Spain in, in treasure ships, uh, as they called it. Um, but they didn't guard it very well because there were almost no people around who, who would steal it. So Drake took advantage of this by simply going to one Spanish encampment near the coast or another and, and taking the gold, you know, holding them up and taking the gold. What was interesting was that in this very violent, dangerous time, uh, Drake himself was pretty, pretty peaceful. Um, he didn't kill a lot of people. He hardly killed anybody. Um, and uh, when you're a sea captain, that's kind of incredible. There was one important exception I'll tell you about in a second. 
uh, and um, he also treated the Spanish captains whom he uh, raided and stole their, you know, gold or silver and gems, whatever they had, with respect. Uh, he he learned Spanish, so there was kind of a bon all me between, you know, between him. So even even while he was robbing them blind, you know, he was treating them with respect. And any ship that he, any Spanish ship that he robbed, he left behind a souvenir uh, with the captain to sort of his trademark, you know, to say Francis Drake was here. Right. So, you know, he, he was sort of a character. He had a certain amount of flair and he was also very cautious. You know, he usually stayed offshore. Um, he was afraid he didn't want to get hit in the middle of a armed conflict, you know, very close range. Um, he was hit in the, in the face once with a spear, which left a big scar. And, uh, you know, that was kind of a warning to him. Fortunately, it was close to his eye, but it didn't damage his vision. Um, so he acquired a reputation, a fearsome reputation in Spain and the nickname uh, as the dragon. So, uh, and it was thought that Drake was so powerful in Spain, they thought this, that he had a telescope where he could see around the world. And, and see anything. So there were all these myths about him. Meanwhile, in England, he, he wasn't that well known. Um, finally, his big moment came with the circumnavigation, which was about 60 years after Magellan's circumnavigation. He used maps and charts and notes from it. So, you know, he really took advantage of Magellan's uh, pioneering efforts and basically corrected the mistakes. Um, when uh, Magellan couldn't find the Strait of Magellan because nobody knew where it was. I mean, it hadn't been named anything at that point. Uh, Drake could follow the maps and he knew how to get there quickly and could uh, traverse it quickly. Um, he knew there was a huge Pacific Ocean that you know he would have to deal with. Um, yet he had some, disillusion some illusions as well. It was believed there was a Northwest Passage so when he was making this circumnavigation, this was uh, uh, 1518, 1521, um, it was, for three years, he, th he thought that uh, he would hit a passage that could take him straight to Asia. Of course, there was no such passage. Um, he kept going north along the west coast of America and didn't find it and uh, finally gave up. Um, he also avoided people as much as possible because the Spanish had traumatized so many of them that when they saw another European type ship coming, um, you know, they attacked and uh, thinking that uh, Drake was the same, you know, kind of aggressive or brutal style as Spain, even though he wasn't. Uh, there was, so there were only a few places where he didn't have to put up with this. But when he got up to uh, Seattle area uh, and Washington State, uh, this, the Spain had never gotten to that region. Um, and uh, there's maybe some Europeans had visited a couple centuries before, but uh, he was basically the first one to be there. And so the Indians were not afraid of him. They were friendly. When I say Indians, this is a loose term for, you know, indigenous peoples, uh, tribes, whatever, you know, nations. However, however you want to call it. Um, and they call themselves by different names as well. And this tribe or group was called the Miwok, uh, M-I-W-O-K. And they were very welcoming. And when Drake showed up with his men, they wanted him to be their leader. Uh, they were so impressed by him. And he left, he and his men left detailed descriptions of how they lived because he lived with them for a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months. Um, and he thought about, you know, becoming their leader, but basically he wanted to get back to Spain with all that gold, you know, and cash in and, you know, be uh, uh, part of the Spanish, I'm sorry, the English establishment. Drake was very, um, you know, ambitious and upwardly mobile. Um, when his uh, circumnavigation ended, it, 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 Elizabeth kept it a secret. The gold was stored in the Tower of London. There was no big announcement, uh, unlike Magellan when he finished his, when you know one ship came back, uh, King Charles made a big deal out of it. 
and everybody knew about it, the English wanted to keep it secret because they were afraid of being attacked by Spain. So uh, Drake didn't get the acclaim he was hoping for. He did get a huge uh, estate called Buckland Abbey, uh, which is now on the National Trust that you can visit. Um, his wife died shortly after he returned. He remarried. This was, I think, an arranged marriage uh, to a noble woman. So, you know, she was several echelons higher than he was in society. And uh, so he was living, you know, the high life. This is just what he wanted. And he had brought back so much gold and silver and gems uh, that had helped keep England afloat wow. for many years to come, you know, kept them solvent. So, of course, Elizabeth was grateful to him, you know, for a while. You know, she could be very changeable. Um, so he was something of a national hero. He, he had a, uh, he became a member of parliament. Um, he was the mayor of Plymouth, uh, the town where he, near, near where he grew up. Um, but it was, he was, his cred, his credibility as an explorer was not known for almost 10 years. Wow. Finally, a book was published by a guy named Hacklett that described English voyages and, you know, gave Magellan his proper uh, credit for, you know, what he had done. But otherwise, it was not generally known. We know about it because uh, Drake and uh, the chaplain on board and some others uh, kept, uh, you know, kept detailed notes, a diary, a travel diary of, of their journals. Um, I had mentioned that Drake didn't kill anybody except with one important exception. Uh, and Drake was very much of his time. He was an Elizabethan. And Elizabethans were very superstitious, mm. which meant he believed in the devil as a real, you know, active force. When he was on this voyage, he decided, uh, and he, we believe in witches, which could be a man or a woman. He, he decided one of the people on the voyage, a guy named John Doughty, was a witch and would harm everybody and kill everybody. So long story short, he had a trial, you know, a kind of a show trial and executed him on the voyage, uh, which could have gotten Drake in a great deal of trouble because Dowdy came from a higher echelon of society. But because Drake was so successful and brought back so much money, everybody kind of forgot about it by the, by the time he got home. So, uh, do I keep going? No, that's, that's, I've been, I've been writing questions over here. Oh, so, okay. um, Elizabeth, uh, she was well educated and this is a time of history where women don't get any kind of education so oh. how did that happen how did she became uh oh. because you also mentioned she was very smart well educated she wasn't even considered to be online for the throne her mother was murdered when she was uh, what two and a half years old so yeah how was how is it that she became so smart or strategic or, or how did she develop all these skills well, she, was, she was cloistered and she was educated by private tutors and she was very smart, so she learned Latin, she learned French, uh, she learned some other languages. Uh, she was very well read. Um, she had beautiful handwriting. Uh, so a lot of this was self-taught or uh, from private tutors. But yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Because really, women at that point were not well educated in general. Uh, that all came later. So uh, she was much smarter than the average, you know, or better educated than the average, even noble woman at that time. Right. And for a time to, because in North America, we are not so much familiarized with um, uh, English history or even uh, this time period. Um, where is England right now in regards to the colonization of America? Oh, it hadn't happened yet. It hadn't happened yet. So Drake Spain was... Spain was the dominant force. Right. England came maybe a hundred years later. I There's see. an expression that we all know the sun never sets on the British Empire. Exactly. In Drake's day, the expression was the sun never sets on the Spanish Empire. Right, right. That was the big empire at that time. Gradually, Spain began to fall apart. The turning point occurred and Drake was involved in 1588 with the Battle of the Spanish Armada, which was one of a number of battles 
between Spain and England. They were direct battles that finally uh, uh, King Philip decided to take on England. Uh, but this was one that Drake, his, well, England won. And it just, it began to be the beginning of the end for Spain. Uh, they realized they weren't the only, you know, uh, uh, omnipotent power in, in the Western Hemisphere that England could challenge them. And uh, also, they were, they were getting rather rigid at, you know, all the years of uh, being the, the, big, the big force had, they had become too confident, let's, let's put it that way. So, um, you know, eventually England uh, became, became more and more powerful and Spain, Spanish Empire became less and less powerful. Uh, you know, they, they had planned to raid England and kidnap Queen Elizabeth and, you know, try her for something, but, you know, they never did that. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the Spanish Empire began to fall apart. At, at that point, right. Drake so, just happened to come along at the right. I'm sorry. So the Spaniards are known for their armada, for their ships that are going all around the world, while England, which from today's history perspective, we know as this naval power, but at that time, they didn't have anything even resembling of a navy. So, first of all, how did Drake? I developed those skills to circumnavigate the globe, being that he's not even from a noble society and probably he doesn't have a lot of money either. So how did he get the skills, the courage, all this from, from uh, a little town of Devon? Is it that that is his name? Yeah, that part of it. Um, in, in a funny way, Spain's um, established bureaucracy and money and wealth got in the way because it was very rigid. Of the English, there were a lot of English sailors and a lot of English ships, but they were mostly in private hands and they were informal. And so you could say they were like guerrillas. So when they were fighting uh, Spain, they were like, um, you know, formal troops, you know, are kind of very vulnerable. And you had this guerrilla navy of, made up of, uh, it was informal. But the, their trip, their ships, the British, the English ships were very seaworthy. And unlike Spain's, the Spanish ships were too tall and the cannons were very hard to move around the deck. Um, it was very hard to load and unload them. The English ships were smaller, lighter, more maneuverable, um, and the captains were more skillful in negotiating uh, the weather. Also, they, uh, England got very lucky because of the weather. Um, this was a period a very uh, stormy weather, and it was called the Little Climactic Optimum, probably caused by sunspots. So for a period of five or 10 years, there were a huge amount of storms in that area. Well, it so happened in August of 1888, when this was 1588, when um, this battle of the Spanish Armada was going on, uh, one of these storms struck, and it, it sank most of the Spanish ships. Um, so they weren't unable to get back to Spain. They tried, but instead of sailing directly back and going south, they had to sail north around Scotland, around Ireland, and take the long way around before they could get back to Spain. And many of them didn't make it. They were destroyed along the way. The sailors washed up on the shores of Ireland and Scotland. Some of their descendants are there now, but many of them were just killed by the locals uh, when they got there. So this was seen perhaps as a sort of a divine intervention in favor of England. You know, whichever way something goes, they always say, oh yes, it was divine yeah. intervention. So it, it was seen that way. And um, so Drake got very lucky. If it, was, it happened when the weather was good, Spain probably would have won. Uh, you know, it would have been a different outcome. So of course, Drake, and his forces took advantage. I should mention, he was not the head of the English Navy or uh, naval forces at that point. Um, he was the best known and one of several uh, captains who were fighting. Uh, but uh, there was a bureaucrat who was in, in charge of all this. And um, it's funny, it's just an irony. The survivors from Spain, when they got back to King Philip, he took good care of them. 
Okay, I'm sorry for the interruption. So you were saying about the um, uh, well, <laughs> we were in the in the battle uh, and Drake won due to a bizarre accident of nature, which the survivor when the survivors from Spain got back to King Philip, he treated them well, uh, and they were treated as uh, you know valiant uh, heroes who had worked for Spain even though they lost. When the survivors who weren't killed got back to London, they were left on their ships. Elizabeth was very, very stingy. And she didn't want to pay to feed them now that the war was over, the battle was over. And if anybody died, she didn't want to pay pensions to the surviving, to the widows and surviving families. So she basically said, you know, screw it. She wasn't going to pay them. So many, many uh, English sailors who were the heroes, who were the victors, died aboard the ship from basically from scurvy, dysentery, not scurvy, dysentery was the big killer of sailors. And so they received, they did not get a hero's welcome. They were treated, you know, despicably by Elizabeth and her ministers. I told you she had a dark side, you know, she could be very, very uh, tough. So uh, it was one of the, the ironies. Drake was, was um, he, he, you know, survived and he was okay. He went back to his big mansion, uh, Buckland Abbey, and his, his second wife. And it was thought that after this was over, he would retire and stay home. He was, you know, in his late 40s. No. He wanted to go back to sea. So after a few months at home, he was back out on, on the ocean again, uh, you know, fighting more battles against Spain. Um, he was in Central America, uh, uh, around uh, uh, Cuba and uh, Puerto Rico. Um, and some of, these, some of these battles he won and some of them he lost. Um, finally, he was north of Venezuela, um, and uh, on some mission or other, and he got sick with dysentery. You know, he was now in his fifties, and he was getting more vulnerable. And there was no, there was no medicine for that. It was a, you know, horrible disease, and it just attacked your digestive system. And he died at sea. Um, well, he died the way he wanted to live uh, in the sea, exactly. fighting yeah. or conquering or stealing or whatever. <laughs> right, right. right. And then there was, he was buried at sea. There was a, uh, uh, a ceremony and his body was placed in a metal cask and tossed overboard in the ocean. Nobody's ever found it. So we don't really know where his final resting place is. Um, this and, is an and amazing he, story. He had, he had no children. So uh, we don't really know. You know, there was no successor to, to Drake. Mm. All, all that go for nothing. But okay, let me ask you, these are amazing military strategies, great battles against one kingdom against the other one. What kind of um, navigation equipment did they have at that time? Well, it was very I just different. opened my phone and I know where I am, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but not well, at that yeah. time. His, his phone was, you know, the battery was very short and very, you know, he, very simple, same as Columbus, really. He had a compass um, and he had uh, maps uh, that, with the help of Magellan, were fairly accurate. Also, pilots at that point, I'm sorry, sea captains at that point, relied on local pilots. So if they were somewhere sailing along the coast of Brazil or somewhere else, they would, if they could find any local pilot they could pay or even kidnap to put on a ship who would explain you know, the local water, waterways to them. So, uh, you know, because they were familiar with it. Um, they had so-called portaline charts, which were, you know, not necessarily scientific, but, you know, showed the harbors and the tides and things like that. But it was not very sophisticated. And often they just relied on their instincts, you know, about weather, especially uh, looking at the skies at the color of the water, um, if it was blue, if it was gray, if it was, you know, white caps. Uh, and make decisions about that. But those are things that sailors do, you know, now, the, the same thing. A lot of it is just uh, by the seat of the pants, as they say. Right. Uh, so it was sort of unsophisticated. 
I'm here in Canada. When I became a Canadian citizen a few years ago, I had to pledge allegiance to the Queen of England, which I still don't understand why, but uh, <laughs> I guess in a way we are part of England. But uh, just to put uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth I on, on the, in context, what event other historic events happened while she was she was queen what, for 44 years something of that yeah. nature so just to put her so what happened in that time period that i can say to my canadian oh, well, or american the, listeners this happened most, while she was queen because of drake's circumnavigation she was able to start the british empire never had been the spanish empire nobody ever even used the term british empire until Elizabeth came along. And she was working with a mathematician um, and mystic uh, named John Dee, D-E-E, -E, who was a fascinating character who coined this term, the British Empire, and wrote a, uh, a treatise about it, you know, a proposal to her um, because it seemed possible to start one. So that was her, you could say, of especially that period of her reign was uh, the main accomplishment was, you know, starting this, British Empire based on Drake's circumnavigation. And, um, you know, a few years later, it became, it became a reality. Drake just happened to be, to come along at the right time. And John Dee had the right theories. Now, John Dee was a fascinating eccentric. He uh, believed he could talk to spirits, you know, to ghosts. And um, he had, there was another world out there. He had something called a scrying mirror, which was about this big. There's an exhibit of them at the, British Museum, and he supposedly could see them through there if he did that or if he used a, a medium to do that. So as I mentioned, it was a very, very superstitious age. So uh, he also uh, uh, believed, uh, you know, in astro In those days, astrology and astronomy were the same. So Queen Elizabeth trusted him so much because she had known him for a long time, she trusted him to pick the day of her coronation. You know, he wanted, she wanted the lucky day, of course. So he was the one who looked at the, you know, planets and the heavens and decided what would be a, a fortunate day for her. So he had great influence. Um, then when he got older, he, he kind of faded out and uh, went his own way. Um, but uh, very interesting, you know, fascinating character. He was, important, little known, but very important part of the, um, her court. Um, another one <coughs> was Sir Francis Walsingham, who started the British Secret Service, which was kind of the successor to James Bond and 007. In fact, when he signed his name, Walsingham, who was in Elizabeth's court, he was a Puritan, he signed it two, two zero o o like that, and a line over it, which was meant to be a looking glass. However, it was also 007, which I might have been where Ian Fleming got the idea for James Bond, you know, the, you know, agent the 007. So uh, anyway, so this was the beginning of the English Secret Service, which was, you know, has been a very important part of, you know, English history and, and uh, I don't know what we call it, foreign policy, you know, ever since. So, uh, as I understand it, under Elizabeth I, then we have the birth of the exploration and colonization of other countries that yes. later on became the, but and how much into her life did Elizabeth I got to see the nascent of the British Empire? Uh, not that much. It was really her successor, King James, who was responsible I for overseeing the Bible translation. Uh, really saw that. So there were a lot of explorers going to uh, America at that point. You know, they were settling Virginia and other colonies and that, you know, it really took off after she died. Uh, then James is his successor right. saw that. But then in a case was uh, uh, this um, Francis Drake that gave the self-confidence and maybe a little bit of go and the know-how for them to begin yes. exploring and venturing farther and farther into right. other he, he, he countries. Of, uh, British uh, naval, uh, you know, ability. So, uh, you know, he... 
Okay, one last. Sure. One last question. Uh, so um, I know that in California, where he landed for a little bit, uh, there have been attempts to destroy the statues of uh, Francis Drake. Uh, and I don't know, is it because at one time he traded with a slave or do you know why? And, and how about in England? Well, I think in, uh, in California, I think people were associating him with the slave trade, except right, he, so you know, he was opposed to the slave trade. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm really not sure why, you know, in California, that's the case. In England, though, he's generally thought of as being a hero. Um, okay. e even now, even in the era when everything is being, uh, you know, re reconsidered, um, he's still considered a a, a British naval hero, and I think I think probably he always will be because he really didn't he didn't do too many terrible things compared to other explorers. If you compare him to Magellan or the Hernan Cortez or Cortez, yes. yeah, it's it's totally or, different. Of or, or Pizarro, hmm. Pizarro, yes, yes, he just you know he just wanted to steal gold. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, um, this is a fascinating book. Uh, Lawrence, thank you so much for writing it. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners follow you? And you have a beautiful website, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, it's called uh, In Search of a Kingdom, uh, Francis Drake, Elizabeth I, and the Perilous Birth of the British Empire. You know, it's available on online, you know, Amazon and everywhere else and in bookstores. Um, I have a website, which is lawrencebergreen.com. It's uh, Lawrence is with a U-L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E. -E. Last name is B-E-R-G-R-E-E-N. So lawrencebergreen.com, www.lawrencebergreen.com. You'll, you'll see a lot more about the book or about me or some previous books that I've written as well. Well, it's a fascinating piece of history, Lawrence. Thank, um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Great talking with you.